culture, um, in terms of gender. So there are so many things the Samaritan community uh, would not do when it came to interacting with the Jews because there were all these barriers that stopped them from having a relationship. And so Jesus comes and he interferes with those barriers and he challenges her thinking and her view of life and her view of different things. And uh, in that conversation, as much as she kept explaining herself out of it, she got to a place where she told Jesus, what do I need to do so that I don't have to keep coming back here? This was a tired person. She had done life a certain way. She had journeyed and perhaps she was looking for solutions. We know the story of this same lady that she was known to have five husbands. I'm sure she was looking for something for her to be moving from one husband to another, but she never really found that rest that she was looking for. And in this life, we can go through life and do many things. But then as we journey through life, unless we meet this Jesus who ministers to, to us a certain way, helps us um, counter some of the arguments in our minds, in our culture, things that we have lived with and have not questioned for a very long time. It's easy to go about this life and never know the true rest that comes from knowing this God who doesn't always do things the way they were introduced to us. He has a way of simplifying life for us and we have found a way of complicating Christianity and many other things. I think some of us will get very shocked when we get to heaven and we find how simple Christianity was supposed to be and how much we complicated it and we never truly enjoyed the rest that comes with having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our prayer and desire is that as we journey together here at the Silver Club, it's our monthly fellowship. It's not about the many activities we will do together. But that little that we do together, I pray that we'll encounter the truth of God's word in a conversation, just like he had a conversation with this woman. And it changed her life for good because the end of that text tells us that this lady, her convictions grew. She was unstoppable. She went around talking to anybody that cared to listen and those that didn't care to listen. He evangelized, she evangelized everybody that she met and a whole village was turned around because the convictions of one person had been established in Christ. She had known true rest. She had found the truth and it was not in the many things she tried to do in life. So I want to believe that um, at a point where we are in life, we have seen a lot. And we know that uh, the many things we've been into or we've tried didn't always work out for us. And so sometimes, especially in the year 2020, we get to a place where we start asking ourselves the question, uh, what is life all about? And so in the year 2020, because of the pandemic, we found ourselves in a place where the church could not meet on Sunday. And I think for me, I took a lot of time to ask myself the question, what is a church without a Sunday service? It is the cathedrals that were shut down. It was not the church that was shut down. But um, God then used that opportunity to help me think through how we do ministry because then if we are too dependent on what we do on Sundays or we think it's because we do it on a weekly basis that we are growing disciples, we could be wrong. We could be very busy but very far from what God asks us to do because God asks us to make disciples based on Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And so um, what some of the lessons that I learned myself or that God reminded me during that time is that God is very keen on discipleship within a community, not as events and not as programs, because truth be told, a Sunday service is an event and we need it because it's a place where we come to celebrate what God is doing during the week. But the question is, what is God doing during the week in the community if the church had, had act in, a, in a big way limited itself to a Sunday service? And we're not talking about Nairobi Chapel churches, we're talking about the global church. Um, these struggles and the questions we're trying to answer now, everybody across the globe is trying to answer that question. And so 
I believe there is a providence of God in a crisis because a crisis forces you to use your resources differently because you realize you can't be spending things the way you are spending your money. It makes you think about your relationships and your friendships. It makes you think about how you spend your time. And that was the gift that God has given us through a pandemic. And so the Silver Club is one of those initiatives um, under our, plat uh, our pl outreach platform called the Beyond Sunday Movement. And so the Beyond Sunday Movement who came about, um, you know, as a, in the process of uh, trying to answer that question, what is church beyond Sunday? I think we had figured it in some way when it comes to young people because we have teams that go to schools every morning. Um, so in terms of reaching out to children in school, but not across the different age groups. And so the Silver Club gives us an opportunity to do more beyond Sunday, where we continue to reach out, but to also disciple people in a very specific way. And so I just want to read something that I'll share with you later. Um, this is like our welcome letter and it also has our FAQs. So to all our guests, we are delighted that you chose to join us today as we launch the Silver Club Monthly Forum. We look forward to journeying together with you as we discover God's best for us in this season of our lives. Again, with those questions that we've been asking in mind. Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3, the Passion uh, Translation says, What delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? He won't walk in step with the wicked, nor share the sinner's way, nor be found sitting in the scorner's seat. His passion is to remain true to the word of I am, meditating day and night on the true revelation of light. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. And I believe that is true of this group. That because we have chosen to journey with the Lord, that we will ever be standing firm like a flourishing tree that is planted by God's design. Everything that God has allowed in your life until now, all the experiences, the good and the bad, uh, God's design entails three things, our personality, our life experiences, and our gifts. And so the journey that we have come until now, the good and the bad, God desires that he will use that to flourish you. That just like this scripture says, I will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design. God's design is in those three things. Your personality, doesn't matter that you're too talkative, you're too quiet, and people have branded you, that as we journey together as a silver club, that you know that God designed you that way for a reason, and he, he wants you to finish well just the way you are, just that he will make you a better person. Um, your gifts and your experiences, that will be deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season. Um, of life. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. That is Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. I saw a quote in a book yesterday by Jim Collins that says, the question of renewal stays with us for our entire lives. Some answer the question with tremendous grace and creativity, becoming 70 years young. Others, sadly, begin to age early, reaching half 70 at 35 years old. Let me repeat that again. The question of renewal stays with us for our entire lives. Some answer the question with tremendous grace and creativity. Becoming 70 years young, others, sadly, begin to age early, reaching half 70 at 35 years old. So I believe here we have the group of the people who want to be 70 years young. Sindio. Um, and that's why we are calling the Silver Club a resourceful generation. You are a resourceful generation because of us, those three things I have mentioned, your experiences, your gifts, 
and um, your personality. But then there is um, even, let me just say this, financial wealth. Because we can't gather a group of uh, university students and, and say that we are the same. God has blessed you. We are a resourceful generation. But we also live in a season where the, our country and our continent is very young. So in light of that, what does being a resourceful generation mean? And so we said that we have values that we will stand for here at the Silver Club because we believe that we should have number one generations that finish well. What does finishing well mean for the Silver Club in a country that is very youthful? Some of those youthful people are in your office because they are your employees, they are your interns. Some of those youthful people are in your house because they are your children. But that's where the country is at. So how much of those resources that God has given us called time, experience, gifts, finances, goes to resourcing a nation that is very young? Of course, we know you pay your taxes. Uh, but God is asking us as the Silver Club to be very intentional. We may not change or affect the entire nation, but together we could say because of this fellowship, a few young people will not walk in confu confusion the way we walked in confusion when we were young professionals. Because we will give our time and our skills to just come, we will gather them for you. You won't need to gather them. Some of you are already doing some of these things out there. But when we gather them for you, that you'll come and share from your stories. And sometimes you'll be shocked that when you people ask just one question and you find that you can talk for an hour, you have so much to say because a young person asked a question. Um, unfortunately, there are many young people who, when they encounter people in this age group, they just see people who put them on their toes or people who remember to say what's wrong with the generation, the millennials and the generation Z. Many of them desire that they would have people to hold their hand and journey with them. And that's our value, that we will have generations that finish well, but number two, the next value is mentorship of the next generation. As in groups, but also to challenge all of us and ask, who are you working with in this season of your life? that they are aware, they know, because it's mutual. You have sat down and you have agreed for the next one or two years, I will work with this young couple, or I will work with these two young people. It's a lot of work because it's relational, but it's beautiful. And this, the Bible has so much to say about mentorship. So we are busy, but just like the woman at the well who asked Jesus, what do I need to do? so that I don't have to keep finding myself in this place. What do we need to do so that we don't keep complaining about the generation, the younger generation that we have? What has been your contribution? And so many times people hear us when we say we need to mentor young people and disciple them, but then we never teach people what mentoring and discipling younger people looks like. We assume they should know because they're in their fifties or because they're in their forties. And so here at the Silver Club, Every time we gather, we will have a guest speaker and then after that we'll go into small groups. And so in those, during those sessions of the guest speakers, we'll do our best to invite the best of speakers we can who will journey with us alongside these values to help us first understand them, but also to leave them out. And so the third value is healthy life rhythms. Again, we said that most of you here are either team leaders or employers, or you have workers under you either at home or your children. And um, we must be those people who teach people how to have healthy life rhythms, to look at our um, wheel of life and just be able to tell the young people that we are mentoring or the ones in our homes that your wheel of life is wobbling, but yours is not even wobbling. It falls. It can't stand. Because I know it's good that you are a very spiritual person and you're always in prayer meetings, or I know it's good that you, you are a very hardworking person. You even carry your laptop home but you need to remember there are these other aspects of life. And when you stand before God one day, he'll ask you, what did you do with your social life? What did you do with all these other aspects of life? What did you do with the finances? And so healthy, healthy life rhythms. 
and conversations we'll continue to have here. The conversation on rest and the Sabbath has become very strange in church circles where yet scripture has so much to say about it. So these are some of the values we hope to keep talking about and challenge the barriers in our minds just like the woman at the well who had a response for everything that Jesus told them, but they were far away from the truth. Because perhaps God will use us to unlock the destiny of very many people by just embracing the truth that is countercultural. And the other value is authentic relationships. Again, many of us are surrounded by people, but they are alone and lonely. Um, and many of us have found ourselves in that space at one point in our lives. Uh, but in this place, we desire to understand what is, is it possible to actually have authentic relationships? And lastly, dependence on God, that all these things cannot be done in our own strength or because we joined a fellowship, but because we would rely on God to give us the wisdom, the courage and the strength to live out these values. And so we'll be talking about um, what Silver Club will look like at the end of our program today. But uh, we are here because we want to obey God, who spoke to us in the year 2020 towards the end, when we were reviewing our approach for ministry. And it came out of the pandemic that Sunday was shut down and we asked ourselves, what is a church beyond Sunday? And so this fellowship, whatever we are launching for the young people that we are calling Propel, a similar forum once a month, um, for those in the university and the young professionals. And we really hope to partner with ILU. They have so many of them in the compound here. Um, we don't need to go very far to look for these people. They are very near us and they really need our advice and our uh, direction. So we are doing this out of obedience. We don't have details of how what God wants to do, but we know that we are in the will of God. Amen. So we'll continue to talk more about why we started Silver Club, but today I just wanted to share our values, um, just to let you know we are obeying out of, just asking ourselves that question, who are we without a Sunday service? If another pandemic or another challenge ever arose, that we didn't have a church venue like we have experienced recently for those of us in Nairobi Chapel, Lavington, would we say now we are no longer a church? Or would we say we have established strong communities of people who um, are being discipled uh, learning to obey the Lord in the different sectors of society where God has placed them. So the Silver Club is on our outreach program, which is the Beyond Sunday Movement program. There are other initiatives across the age groups. And our desire is that God will use us to think through the different sectors of society. As we grow in life, we are in those sectors of society. How do we continue to empower each other so that we can be everything? We can be like that woman who went and turned around her village because her convictions continued to grow. Amen. So at this point, I want to welcome our host here. That is Dr. Tim Kiruhi, the Vice Chancellor here at the International Leadership University, who will welcome us into this space. But he will also uh, have the privilege of, of inviting our speaker of the day, uh, who he knows very well. So Karibu sana, Dr. Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Judy, and uh, good morning. Praise the Lord. It's a joy for us to welcome you to the International Leadership University. Uh, you are already resident here uh, through your offices for the Nairobi Chapel Lavington. But uh, today, of course, is a special day as you launch a new program. And as I got to know about it, I reached out to Pastor Judy and said, it would be nice to be able to do that. We were there as well when you launched your offices here, and we are happy to journey together. Just very briefly uh, about the International Leadership University, since uh, you are here, is that uh, we are Christian University, and a shamedically Christian, and we seek to empower you uh, and the church uh, to serve this nation and to serve, of course, Africa. Our vision is for Africa. Our mandate, as you may have seen as you came through the gate, is to develop leaders of integrity, a very rare species <laughs> in our country today, isn't it? across the various sectors, unfortunately, you know, which is a paradox of our country. On one side, 85% 8 claim to be Christian. On the other side, getting a person of integrity is, is a hard find. 
But that, that's the space we believe God has called us into. And uh, this week I had the privilege of being at a, a forum of the Evangelical Churches, uh, Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, who invited us as a resource. We, we felt very honored that they would consider ILU as a resource. We are not actually members, <laughs> but they invited me to just spend time with their bishops. And um, as they talked about the various needs of the church, the church is in a difficult place generally. And, uh, you know, I just felt affirmed in some of the things that we are doing to serve the church. And I'll share just three very quickly, then I go do my main business of, of being here. We have three outcomes that we desire of every training that we are doing. Actually, I'll, I'll be sleeping away because we have two going on right now. Short courses, one on mediation. We have another one. Uh, we've been invited by the Kenya Christian Professionals Forum, which is an umbrella group for professionals from different uh, sectors. Uh, because of the same thing I talked about of integrity, they actually want us to have an induction course for all their members and talk about this business of integrity because it's a difficult thing, even for Christians in the marketplace. So we are going to be launching that today. That We're doing one with their board and their team. We improve it and then we'll be rolling it out. So I'm sure you may be hearing about it in the future. But uh, the three outcomes are one is in the area of character development, that whole area of integrity, values that uh, Pastor Judy talked about, ethics, and things like that. Today we don't talk enough about those things and uh, of course unfortunately this that should be formed from home as I'm sure you'll be hearing but uh, of course we, we have a role to also strengthen that as we go on and we desire that for every student. It's actually a requirement at ILU for you to graduate. We have one who could not graduate last year because there were gaps in character that were too glaring and we felt we cannot send them to society. Of course we will want to provide we are providing a restorative process we don't damage people, <laughs> but I want to make sure that character is not in question so that the product out there fits the bill. And those of you who are employers would have confidence that if it's a graduate from here, we hope they will not disappoint in the area of character. Secondly, of course, it's competencies. You are an educational institution, so we must develop needed competencies and do the very best you know, in our classes, in our research. We are trying to strengthen that so that the research is relevant, addresses the needs in the society, and can speak to the issues, but not just knowledge, which I think is the main area that most institutions are focused on. Of course, those skills, life skills and attitudes that are important for success. And finally, contextual relevance. How can we speak to the issues of the day? And Pastor Judith has done well to enumerate a number of issues for us who are senior, uh, you know, in, in society, so to speak, but also then the issues that are going on in the day. How does the Bible speak to electioneering, which is a big deal this year, isn't it? You know, what's the Christian view to, how, how do you vote even? Is it just on ethnicity? Are there biblical, things like those and others in your context. So a person, a graduate who is able, strong in character, competent and able to engage their context and bring transformation based on a kingdom agenda and biblical values. So we invite you, we want to partner with you. I wanted to just share with you. Uh, in case you, you know you are the person who is most of us may be nearing, of course, so called, so called retirement. Well, we can refire you at ILU <laughs> into a second career. <laughs> we actually have a lot of students. In fact, uh, a lot of our students for a long time have been senior citizens. So this is, you'll be very comfortable here. We do it online. Our master's programs and our PhD programs in leadership, in theology, in counseling, psychology. And uh, you'll be able to, you know, be able to gain the skills and also just sharpen what you already know. In many ways, you'll be coming to label things you already know because uh, you have lots of experience, but of course, now you'll be able to frame it in a scientific way and be able to speak to those issues. Uh, our own speaker, who I'll be introducing shortly, came after having been a principal of a high school and was able to launch an, an, a whole second career that I'm sure many of us now know her for uh, in the public space and in the church. So in case you are getting nearing that space, no, no worries at all. There is hope for you. <laughs> you can refire <laughs> into a new second career. This is the beauty of, of, of being alive today, isn't it? With modern medicine and so on, we are going to live to the 90s in good health, you know? And so there is a lot of way ahead of you. So no, no, no fear and so on. Our speaker this morning is one of our, uh, we are one of our proud, we are proud to have her. No, she's not proud, it's us who are proud to have her as one of our alumni, because she also is a product of International Leadership University. And uh, she not only worked, uh, did her studies here, uh, the, the faculty of course supported her gifting and talent, invited her to come and serve on the staff of ILU. 
and, and now she's done many, many firsts in this country. One of them was, of course, the department she did here at ILU. And then, of course, went on to work also in the diocesan office for the Anglican Church, in the nation's department, I believe, at first. And then more recently, as the provincial secretary who serves all the bishops of the Anglican Church in this country. Uh, she and her husband are both in ministry. He's also an engineer, but who also called to ministry, the Reverend Engineer Peter, uh, so Peter Bogo. And uh, together, of course, they have grown children and are proud grandparents. So without further ado, I'm looking forward to us being able to listen and hear very useful principles. I'm sure you've seen some of her books uh, outside there, especially the most recent about uh, you know the whole area of how a spiritual leader is sustained. And I'm sure that there'll be some life-giving principles from the Reverend Canon, Dr. Uh, Rosemary Bogo. Let's welcome her as she comes to the Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tim, uh, Vice Chancellor, IRU. Thank you, uh, Pastor Judy, and the leadership team of uh, Nairobi Chapel, uh, Lovington Branch, and all of us who have come. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, praise the Lord. It's indeed my joy and privilege to come and share with us this morning more specifically at this very crucial moment when the church has discovered the need to round to a very specific area of enfolding this age group that is before us uh, for more elaborate ministry. And I give glory to God for that. Many years I sought for rest, Perfect peace within my breast, and I often saw the Lord alone in tears. But I would not pay the price, would not make the sacrifice. So I wandered on and on for many years. Then one day, when pardoned in prayer, Jesus whispered to me, There, on take your cross and follow me to Calvary. Oh, how hard it was to die and ourselves to crucify just to lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. Let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. May ourselves be slain my Savior, see on thee. Even though it may cause me grief and pain, I will fight my life again. If I lose my life, I'll fight it, Lord, in thee. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Over four decades ago, I lost my life because the Lord Jesus Christ took over the Lordship of my life. Because whoever I am today, whatever I am, whatever I do, whatever I have, I totally accord it to the gifting and the working of God in my life. The Lord Jesus Christ called me to himself when I was a young girl of 14 and a half. And we have journeyed with the Lord, leading, loading, directing every aspect of my life. So I am today because of him, and I give glory to him for that. I am married, as uh, has been introduced to Reverend Virginia Sospita Mbogo. I bring his apology under normal circumstances that have been here to be in, a, in accompanying me, but he had to attend a cousin's burial. And you know that it cannot be postponed. So he traveled to our uh, hope country in Embu this early morning because they are burying a cousin today. And please do receive his apology, but you can be assured he has been part of the prayer process uh, to enable even what we are going to share this morning. We are blessed with four children who have added us four and added us eight. That is biblical arithmetic, which is a promise of God for his children. 
uh, four children are grown up, they are married, all the four of them, so their brought has grown up four children, who call us mom, dad, and between them they have given us eight grandchildren. We give all glory and honor to God. Our eldest grandson turned 12 yesterday, just yesterday, and the rest follow in a line, with the youngest uh, being slightly under one year. We are so humbled by what God does and his faithfulness to his children. Yes, uh, Pastor Judy has already said the need of this gathering this morning is to extend our endeavor and witness beyond Sunday. And when she said that, I was reminded of this couple that went out of the country for an undertaking. And they arrived where they were going, checked into their hotel early Saturday morning. After being in the flight for many hours and joining uh, in different airports, they had been on travel for three, da three days. So they were very exhausted. So they told themselves once they checked into the hotel, if we just begin unpacking, it will be so difficult for us to arise. We we'll find ourselves falling asleep and being to, able to find out where we can attend service tomorrow. So they said, before we unpack, let's check around, which is the most convenient place where we can walk tomorrow for a service. And they did walk around. They got into this church and they found the caretaker or the vanja uh, of the church and they asked, what time does the Sunday service begin tomorrow? And the furniture said, we don't have any Sunday service. What we have is a worship service. And the worship service begins at 10 minutes to 10 and ends exactly at 12 of noon. But it is immediately after that that the Sunday service begins. And the Sunday service begins for the rest of Sunday, continues through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, until 10 minutes to 10 when we gather for worship service. Beloved, that has always been a, an inspiration into my life as I minister to myself and to those that I minister among. The question is, are you in service or are you just an attendee of a Sunday service, which is meant to be a celebration moment, a time of retraining and recreating and stirring us to get back into the community and do that which we are called to do for the glory and the honor of God. So this morning, as we are stirred to rouge ourselves on the pad and into the spaces where God has put us for Sunday service every day of our lives and at the age that we are at, the question we need to be asking ourselves is, are we discerning? Are we at? Are we connected? Are we at that that space that I step into is divine space, is almighty space, and it has a very specific timing that God puts me into so that I am consistently conscious that I cannot account for it tomorrow. I need to account for it today. Today is my calling in that space. Friends, transition is daily. Since change is in the atmosphere, by the time we move out of this gathering this morning, we shall be a little older than we were when we came. You will have done nothing, apart from sitting and maybe standing a little when we have been asked to, and of course, taking a cup of tea and our snacks. That's all what you have done, nothing more, but you will be older. And God calls us to be alert, to be witnesses, even as time transitions in whatever positioning that we are at and where we are. 
the key moments or seasons of change are meant to leave us a rat with the familiar and take up out steps to a new beginning and the context of operating every day of our lives. And the central thing is managing me, managing you. That is, I have to constantly speak to myself and ask, how am I managing me? How am I managing the divine moment that God has put in my hands? Managing in such moments of change is crucial and the change is constant. Aim at maintaining that undisputable union with the owner of our lives so that we are clear that the owner of our lives is consistently at work within us and we are sensing is reading and is directing of us so that we don't lose that moment of connectivity together with him. The unfamiliar new spaces that we step into even with age come with age dilemmas. They come with age dilemmas. And I'm sure each one of us has one or two or more or a multiplicity of them where we ask, what have I achieved? Where am I at? How involved am I in my spouse's life? Or how involved am I in my children's life? They seem to be transitioning so fast that before we realize it, you have an empty nest like us. Right now, with a big house of five, six bedrooms, the whole house is three quarters more or so empty. Periodically occupied when my grandchildren visit with us. But the truth is, it's emptiness. It's my husband and I and our house helper. That is all. The rest of who come, even our own children are visitors. They come and they are on transit. They are not there to stay. And probably, if I am not or we were not conscious, we would only be sitting there in that house and mourning over lack of occupancy because we did not align ourselves with the calling of God and the assignments that God puts in our lives. We need to be so alert. With age dilemmas, there are also age advantages. And each one of us must identify the advantage of their age because every age has got its advantages. There are things that we can do now because of our age that we could not have done. And when we go born again in our days, we used to say, there is a big wide change since I got born again. The things I used to do, I do not do them anymore. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ takes lordship in our lives, there are certain things we shed off and there are new things we are allowed to be part of us as witnesses of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But today, my song is not just related to the turning away from sin and certain relationships. My song today is about the things that I used to do and an example I normally give is waking up at five, cleaning and washing up nappies. That is not your generation. Because you people have diapers, which you use and dispense. For us, we had to clean dozens of nappies. And napkins, washing, and the hearing was a duty in itself. So that by the time I am leaving for work, I have gotten all the three dozens, four dozens aired. And I have prepared my buckets so that my babysitter will be able to put, clean up and you have done, given your instructions. What is to be put in this bucket uh, for the, the wrong call and what is going to be put in this bucket, I will come and handle that. I have prepared the baby's food. And most likely, 
I have cleaned and aired up my bedroom and maybe some of the other bedrooms. I used to do that. But today I don't have to wake up at five to do that. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. I do not even have to overburden myself with cleaning up the house per se, because what will the house helper be left to doing anyway? There is no food being prepared for anybody. We are not even coming for lunch. You know, we are busy with the assignments that God has given us. The, the alignment is different. So my energy is freed, but let me be frank. Although my energy is freed, I don't have energy to bed and clean up a six bedroom house in my age every day occasionally yes and maybe very specifically and that is my center part i clean my bedroom and that is my room and i arrange but and my bathroom but the rest of it the house helper will do that you get it those are the advantages and we must ask what am i doing with the singled out advantages of my age but there are also obligations very specific obligations that come with a specific age span or season of life. Right now, for me, I am a witness daily of generations. My grandchildren are ranging from one year to 12. The one who is 12 years in the last month came and told me, you know, grandma, I'm turning 12. I'm going to be soon a teenager. So we got into a conversation. So what does it entail when you become a teenager? My voice will break. And he began speaking as though the voice was already broken. Yeah? And my skin is breaking up. And we got more conversation. That is a very different generation with the one year old. I have an obligation to the year, one year old grandchild and an obligation to the 12 year old. My granddaughter, the eldest, is turning 10 in August. That is my son's daughter. They live in Dubai and work in Dubai. In December, they had visited. And as we stayed for a month plus because the airlines crossed and they could not go back when they were supposed to have gone back. So we had a longer time to be together. And of course, if they are visited, they are fully in the house because they don't need a home elsewhere in Nairobi for only visiting. I looked at my granddaughter as we interacted through the course of the, the period. The breasts have begun to fall. The armpit air has already started at 10, going to 10. And so I was a rat and designing the conversation I didn't hold with this girl. And then in that process, I even asked the mother, by the way, have you talked with your daughter in preparation for her menses? And she said, yes, I have begun. I told her, you know what? You have to complete. You have to be all the, the spark of readiness with her. All the signals and the signs are there. That this girl could be having her menses any time. And this is a less than 10 year old. She'll be turning 10 in August. So are we a rat to the parenting that we are doing, to the children who are around us? Because that is our obligation. There are also ambitions that come with age. Very peculiar. Some of the ambitions that you are having right now, you did not have them when you were 10 years old, when you were 20 years old. There are things you are desirous to do, and to find yourself learning with, but they were not part and parcel. The key thing is, we must be a rat. Both in our season, the opportunities, and fully plug in and connect. Isaiah 7, 9b says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. It will be a lie. You will be beating about the bush and you will find yourself meandering around the, the, the callings of life. 
It's important to know that there is no square inch in the world, the whole of the world domain, as well as in your own spaces where we exist, over which Christ, who is not the sovereign Lord of all, does not declare and they cry out, mine. So you as a person, Christ declares, you are my space. You are mine. Where you step in your environment of work or business, in your interactions, wherever you are, that is almighty space. And I've always had a quarrel, even with the leadership of the church, where I serve, and say we can be over ambitious about protecting the sacred space. And we forget none of us gets to a sacred space without passing through the public space. We all drove as we came together. This is a, a, a sacred, we can say this is a sacred moment because we have declared this is our habitation for today, isn't it? But where did, how did we get in here? through the public space. And after this, we are going to go back to wherever we are going through the public space. Some of us are going to pass through shopping malls, picking one or two things. That is public space. But we also are going to get back to our private space, our dwellings, our residences. The private, public, sacred spaces are all almighty space. There is no inch of existence in the land of Kenya and the, in the group at ranch, which is not almighty space. And we must ask God to help us because many a times we have declared certain sections of the land to, bring the, to belong to the devil. And even say certain shrines are for the idolaters. But for God so loved in the world, that symbol entry first at Sunday school, children church, that he gave his only begotten son. He still loves the world today. And that world has been impacted by you and me in the way we are aligned with the calling of God in our lives. I wondered why the choice of silver and not gold. And uh, I took time to reflect. You know, sometimes when you're invited, it's very easy to quickly say yes. And I had said yes. And I, but when I got to begin to prepare, I realized, mm, okay, there are a few things I need to listen it with so that I can get this group to understand exactly what are they actually about. When, when I go to sit down, everybody about this age are referred to them. They call themselves the golden age. When we come to us at all saints, uh, it's golden age and senior citizens. And uh, when I go elsewhere, they'll give all the different namings. So this one, you deliberately decided silver. So I decided let me take some time and see what does the Bible say about silver? Silver goes or comes or precedes gold. In scripture, the word occurs along with gold, that is mentioned together with gold, more than 60 times. Silver has the highest electrical and thermal conductivity of any metal. That reminds you, I am married to an engineer. <laughs> yeah, he's a mechanical engineer. Not only that, he was in charge of the hydro power stations for many years. Seven folks, where all this power comes from. And then before he retired, he was project, you know, project engineer. He was in charge of the construction of Sodom Miriu, totally as a project engineer before his retirement. But the key word here I'm saying is, silver is the highest, and I, I need you to hear that clearly, highest electrical and thermal productivity of any metal. What does that really mean? You are in a very critical position. Very, very of conductivity, of connectivity. 
Silver is present everywhere. Everywhere. You cannot go to any household and miss silver. Go to the offices, there will be silver. Go to the market and the shopping mall, you meet, find, you don't have to struggle to find the silver. Silver is mentioned 300 times in the Bible. Silver is variable. It's also clear. It's a natural symbol for wealth and for what is precious. To be clear, silver pictures a process of refinement. Actually, it says, that, you know, like the silver is held over the fire, at the refiner's fire, and it is burnt until the master can see his image in it. So we are in a stage and an age and a season that is very precious that has connectivity. We are in a season that God is calling us to refinement, to the touch of the core of our being so that we can lessen it with the workings of God. Actually, in the short, I would say, it's either now or never. So, it's a period and a stage that we must commit, commit to purity and refinement. Instruction and knowledge or wisdom is foundational in this season of life. Proverbs 8, verses 10, and then you can progress, verses 18 to 19 says, Choose my instructions instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold, which what I yield surpasses choice silver. What I yield, what I produce surpasses choice silver. So though Silver is precious as a metal and is everywhere. And we are reckoning or comparing ourselves with silver. The Lord is speaking to our hearts and saying, when you receive my wisdom and my counsel is with you, what you shall produce now as my object, as my image, as my child, my son and my daughter will be more precious than the precious wealth of this world. Praise be to God. Amen. We have capacity to do far and beyond what we can even imagine at this moment in time. Being in the silver stage or season denotes variable strength of conductivity and presence. You have space and power to influence to which your awareness and proactive response is key. And the question is, are you growing and consolidating your gifts or are you stagnated or frustrated? Are you in an acceptance stage? Are you and have you around yourself to be given into mentorship and care that are crucial elements of the refinement process. It's also a stage of resilience. This is a very strong stage of resilience. You can, over, you can take a lot of beating. Yeah, a lot. Because this is a stage your, at the peak, most likely, of your career those of us who are career professionals, counting down the remaining number of years to retirement. This is the stage that your children, if you are a married person, are in their levels of high, you know, academic progression. And when they are settled down into careers, 
when they are beginning to move to be independent. And all those are stressors. They stretch you. Because the career, children, family, this is the age when we lose our beloved parents or have already lost. So that is a stretcher. Because you have to handle that, that we are, parents are, even if we have not lost them, they are declining in capacity of energy and strength and they are needing more of our care, our visitation, and our accompaniment. This is a stage when you begin to realize, Unaito Mama, wherever you go. And you wonder, am I that old? Some of us struggle with that, isn't it? I don't know what the men feel, because I'm not one. Baba Songea, Baba Kahapa. Eh? Na, 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 yeah, you know those, those terms that like, even our own children refer to us to, especially when they are on their conversation in their social media and they are referring to their social peers about you. You are kaik, your own fashion. That's how they see us. Archaeology, <laughs> the yester years. But you, you are sitting there thinking, uh -huh. I am in it. I have, I'm in the fad of the time. But the truth of the matter is, But it's, we can be resilient. Because we, that, that is what this age does. Because of the exposure, the experience, uh, the interactions, the exploration. And of course, we have been skilled over the days. And that skills are part of us and they, they enable us to withstand some of the storms that come along our way. We also are in a stage when we revamp ourselves. We, we want to do a new setting of, of ideals. I mean, I have sat with many people over, you know, this age and golden ages, and many of them are saying, yeah, we have been living in a flat now, Lily, it's at our age, we need to move into a, a, a place where we have the ground. So there are movements. Uh, they are sale for, to, you know, to trade for this other thing. There are, there are alternatives being made. There are the rearrangements, not only in the living space, but also in the dwelling, in the residential choice sites. Some decide. I'm now deciding a little bit to be out of the nuclear CBC, you know, CBD areas or where it is too crowded. I want a more quieter environment on the you know, suburbs of Nairobi or we are going to other towns. Some even completely relocate to their counties because the counties have also become very attractive centers. This is a stage. This is a stage where we reinvent ourselves. And we all need a lot of pruning for that to happen. So that there is room for growth, there is also room for gratitude, to be thankful for where we have come. Beloved of this variable class, because this is our class. I mean, maybe I'm a little ahead of you. You say, although I am 50 plus, 10 plus particularly for the ones who are just beginning, at the 50, and 10, that's where I am. But we are in the same bracket. People of this precious class, we need spiritual borderlines and safeguards to help us do the following. Spiritual borderlines and safeguards to help us make appropriate adjustments in order to adopt and rearrange what we have with what we can do. That we must speak into. And oftenly speaking to that by yourself becomes very difficult. You need to be in the company of others to hear them, analyze, interrogate, communicate with you so that you can find yourself in that conversation. 
and then you are able to adopt and to align yourself clearly. Standing it alone, you will find you did what more often is done, self-talk. No, you do self-talk. Unajiambia, unajiuliza maswali, unajijibu, unakaa pale, unasema, I can't make it. I will never make it. I am not able to. But when you sit in the midst of a few other people and you hear, by the way, this is, I struggled with this thing. But today, you know what? I have risen and this is where I have come. Praise be to God. That makes all, all the difference. Your energy is activated. You are stand afresh. You are encouraged. You are stimulated. Sometimes you feel, you know, you are so vulnerable. But you listen to your sister, to your brother, and say, and you realize they are even in a more vulnerable state than you are. And you see, I can overcome. It is doable. And that is important. The second thing is, is we do this having the spiritual borderlines and safeguards to redivine our self-worth without getting stuck in remorse of yesterday's, yesterday's disappointments. You know, some, at this age, you have tried some things. Those who are in business, I don't know how many are in business. Yes, you have tried some things and you know how hard you have been hit, particularly with the corona pandemic. Some of us are wondering, do I continue this line or do I completely shift? And even the shifting, you wonder, do I have the energy to restart? Do I have the capacity? Do I even have the goodwill of the clients that I, I had acquired over the time? And our, we can get depleted of energy. So the yesterday's disappointments, and all of us can name them, whether it's in the social domain, in the physical domain, in, you know, in, the, in the spiritual domain, we all go through disappointments. I can name mine, and they are not few. But we need to be in a cohort where we speak about frustrations and how dealing with human beings we have to be ready to realize we are not at the same maturity level we are not the same at the same you know skilled levels or experience levels and people will hurt us and we also have arrogant prideful people among us but we can overcome that is important. We also need to address the anxieties of the moment. Because we are anxious. We are anxious. Menopause is no key. For some of my dear sisters here, the hot flashes have come on board. The struggle with insomnia at night. And now you're only wondering, you're very sick. Unaenda kwa daktari, sinjarara for the last three months. Na daktari anakuliza shinda ni wapi, sijui shinda yangu. And probably the only answer is some, to sit at the feet of somebody who tells you, why are you not, have you been taking water? How much water do you take in a day? Why have you not been taking, you are drying yourself up. Because after 50, the body, water retention goes to half. 50%. And the only way to keep yourself energized, alert, and ongoing is a constant intake of water. You can almost ask how many glasses of water have my sisters taken since they woke up. Of course, the brothers need the same too. And maybe some of you will tell me not yet. It, you haven't even taken her. Huh? I've already taken three liters myself before I came here. Yes. A little before I brushed my teeth. A little as I went to brush my teeth. And I took a bottle of lemon water. We have to be intentional. This is not the age to be feeding your stomach with starch. You are not a hyper. And some of us don't even go to the field. So how are you going to burn it? It sits on you. That's what it ha happens. 
that starch will sit on you. And we will never give birth again. <laughs> so, why are we growing our public opinion? And we are I'm just being brand, eh? Because we must speak to ourselves. So, it's a niche where we have to take, check our diet. Three quarters of our intake after 50 should be fruits and vegetables. Very measured small kaugari. Umezoea preti ya ugari. It is just a little one like this. Actually, you should measure it like this with your fingers. And not before you go, not just 30 minutes before you go to lie down in bed. We must speak to ourselves. We must exercise. Praise be to God. Are we together? We must. And then, we must also address the panic of the future. See, I've said yesterday, disappointments, anxieties of today, and then panic of the future. Panic of the future is terrible for this age. Panic until you're not living today. And scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has got enough worries for itself. And even when you plan, you say God willing, because you don't know whether you'll be brought to tomorrow. So that means live wholesomely today. Be present. Have a heart of celebration and thanksgiving today. Know that you celebrate when you are last born or graduate. My friend, celebrate and look for milestones to celebrate today. Amen? Thirdly, we need spiritual borderlines and safeguards to grow our investments. The redivining ourselves with, with the yesterday's disappointment, anxieties of today, and panic was all number two. So number three is grow our investment and business enterprises with the consciousness that our daily practice in handling money and wealth is of concern to God. We need to speak into that. So have spiritual borderings. How do you acquire wealth? What do you do with that wealth? How do you factor in posterity in your wealth growing? I tell you, and this one I'll tell you for free. I was a, a church minister of Lovington United Church for five years. I live in Lovington. My major entry point into the ministry and among those affluent people who live in Lovington, Kirimani, Kirireshua, Runda, Modaiga, New Modaiga, and name all those. And I have visited with many homes. And it's a sorry state when you sit one-on-one -on -one and they open their hearts and say, Pastor, where did I go wrong? Where did we go wrong? Finding rodent, elderly couples. They have all the wealth that the world could have. They don't even have one child anywhere near them. The only people they have are one or two workers, and of course other workers in their business enterprises. But they are wondering, my energy is dreary. No child is interested in coming back from Australia, from US, from Canada, from wherever. Why did I invest? Was I wrong in taking them to study where they went to study? Did I, where did I go wrong? So friends, we must have spiritual borderlines and safeguards. God needs to be invoked into the things that we are about. Because you cannot spend all your energy, all your time, all your effort, all your capacity on things that are going to die with you. It is foolish, isn't it? We must think about the longevity of life beyond yourself. So that even as we invest, we incorporate other significant 
persons, interacts, and connections that God will bring into our minds so that we do not do things that are ending with us. Your energy is precious. Your gifts are precious. You are and I are stewards. And stewards will be made to account for everything that God raised in our hearts. So we must speak into those settings of life. What do we do? What choice or business enterprise do I go for? What type of investment do I venture into? And how can they be sustained in the years to come? Because there are more than 2,000 verses on the subject of money and possessions in scripture. What we do and how we do it reflects on our spirituality. The right attitude and perceptions to wealth with a bearing on the legacy and posterity is critical. We need to be honest and connected. We need to pay on time, know how to pay on time our workers, give attention to every area of our life. We should not borrow for consumption and we should not also love money. This is also a very tricky age because somebody is counting down on the time, so it's very easy to get into unwarranted even mortgages that become a strain and a stress on your age and energy and you die faster before your time and you are investing on things that are going to become obsolete within a very short time because they are just a title prestige thing even the change of cars we drive sometimes it's not because it's a necessity yet we may do that on higher purchase and mortgages that are going to become very weighty on us. We need to discuss this and talk about this and then how to further the kingdom of God. We must also learn and nurture healthy self. That is number four. Learn and nurture healthy self. So we discuss that in our cohorts, cohort groups as we sit. How to nurture healthy peer children and grandchildren worker colleague relationships we must be found in fellowship and create authentic friendships to do life together we must do life together and submit to supervision and delegation be able to allow ourselves to be supervised but also to delegate when we need to do that Be this others for growth that are in our care relate and connect for support in times of crisis, loss and grief, as well as for celebration. The church gathering for worship on Sunday is too broad for it to be the place where we are reached up out when we are in need of care and support. We need smaller groups that will help us be able to minister to and with one another. So we need to give primary place to self-care as well. Healthy, and that I've already talked about, healthy eating, exercise, rest, solitude, in order not to cause pain to ourselves or even to others. When we are unwell and our children are only in their 30s beginning to settle down, we are overbearing on them. And some of the ailments could have been avoided. It's simply because we were careless with how we took care of ourselves. May God help us to be a rat. And for the fifth three and the last is that we must get back to the community. That is the church outside worship. Connect your wealth to the altar of God whom you worship. The altar of God. So you go for blessings in the worship gathering at that altar that is sacred but connect thy, thy service and their, their, your wealth with the altar of God, which is, which is across the land. Which is across the land. That when you come, my husband and I, we run a prayer retreat and conference center. When you enter, when you are ministering to the communities, we, uh, uh, my father-in-law, passed on last year 
in July at 101 and a half. He was fully in charge of his life. A retired lady and evangelist of the church. My mother-in-law had passed on 13 years earlier. But my father-in-law was in charge. It's only the last two months of his life that my father-in-law could not kneel for two hours, making his prayers of intercession every morning. And that was a agony in his spirit. When he would be in my house, I'm about to leave, I would check in his room to give him breakfast. I find him on his knees. Wait for 30 minutes when I get ready, I check again, he's still on his knees. And then I would have sometimes tell my house helper, please give him breakfast, tell him I could not wait longer. And we would confess. So I would ask, how do you go through your intercession? And he would share with me with a sharp mind, with clarity. He was in charge of his farm and his workers up to the last two months of his life. It's now my husband and I, though we knew it was our inherited lad, we only supported him while he did his things. Now we stepped, we have stepped in and we are const co constantly being reminded we are still ones of this which has been put in our hands. It can't just be business as usual. And so we are, the last five months, we have intentionally renovated, reassigned, you know, the rook of the farm because it's going to be a well of refreshing for the community, a place of ministry for the community. Friends, we must be alert about the things that God gives to us and they have to, by the way, utanjiri wote. Ule ukona wao, nao, ata wasidi, ujue ni wandunia hii. Hakuna mahali utaenda na yo. Ile, ata ile asidi. What I mean is, even that secret account, which probably you may be hiding from your wife, or from your husband. Hawendi na yo. And if you keep hiding until you die, ujue, itahaji watu kwa dunia, hita saindia, muke wako, buwana yako, ata watoto yako. We just have to be sincere, open, transparent. You know, yote ni andunia. Utaenda vile uko. Now imagine that if we even maybe buy you a new suit uh, and for the ready some clothing and put you in the coffin, which we shall buy. As a community, because uh, it is not left to the family alone. And then you leave the rest. So let's not be fooled. It's a, a moment in time when we have to be very, very alert. Because of time, as I finish, let me just read this uh, uh, the few verses in Psalms 39, verses 4 to 7, and then say one statement and sit. Psalms 39, verses 4. O Lord, make no, me know my end and what is the measure of the, my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely, all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely, a man goes about as a shadow. Surely, for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who to gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Praise be to God. Let's connect with God. Let's connect with ourselves. Let's connect with each other to the honor and the glory of God. God bless you. Uh, thank you so much, Canon Rosemary. We, we wish you had more time. Um, there's clearly a lot to learn from one another and we believe that this is you will also continue to journey with us beyond today. We would love to ask questions. Today we don't have an opportunity to do that. And I believe this is the beginning of a beautiful journey. Amen. I want to invite uh, um, John Bindio um, to join me on stage. Um, my apologies. Clearly we will not manage to finish at 9.30, but we'll do our best for this last session. 
um, and then we will learn from the first day and figure out how to structure ourselves for other fellowships. Um, we just want to walk you through uh, what the Silver Club will look like in the days to come. And uh, so what we did is we developed a list of the frequently asked questions. We will run through them and then we will also post them to, to you. But today we just want you to, know, to go knowing so the way forward. So please turn to your neighbor and tell them retirement is a social construct. So we, sh we shall retire when we die. So God has work for us. Um, do you have the, the scripture? So we share this. Okay. So I will read one and he will take us through the next like that. And so these are um, our first question is how often will this be? And it, it, this is a monthly breakfast. It will be every last Friday of the month from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. We will move the venue from here to the Nairobi Club. Um, there are just so many logistics of trying to host everything ourselves. So it's easier to go to a place where they always have rooms, always have breakfast and have everything planned for us that way. So we just walk in and do our program. Uh, so we will move the meetings to Nairobi Club every last Friday of the month from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30. Um, the only month who will not be having this forum is, is the month of December because it's a family time and uh, many people are usually probably out of town. Yeah. So in terms of uh, cost, I hope you can hear me. So in terms of cost, uh, the Silver Club will be self-funded. And uh, because we are trusting that at this age, some of us have a lot of resources. We're not paying school fees, you know, so what else to do with that money? Uh, so it's self-funded. The church covered the cost today, and we appreciate Pastor Judy and the church for covering this cost. Uh, the launch budget is going to be, today was sponsored by the church. The breakfast will cost approximately a thousand shillings. Just that for the once in a month fellowship. And that will be able to just cater for the food that we eat. And just a small token to the guest speakers that come. Was, wasn't that wonderful with the canon uh, to this morning? That message, honestly. Wow. I, I was just busy taking notes and soaking it in. Yeah. 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 And of course, it also goes to the venue. Um, when it comes to the format, uh, like I said, it's monthly forum. And when we gather, we'll be having a big group. So every month we will look for a speaker. I believe uh, Canon Rosemary will come back to us. She clearly has a lot in her. But I believe this country has so many people we have not met that have so much to say to this group. And so we'll be having a big group where we get a guest speaker. And then after that, we'll be going into small groups where we will be discussing the book that you have bought. So you'll read a chapter. It's not about uh, pumping ourselves with information. But just that one chapter, you take time to reflect and process. Please don't read that morning because it's one chapter. <laughs> the idea is that you have time to reflect, to reflect and process. And then when we come here, we go into our small groups. So we are not about finishing a program or a book. We are about fellowship and growing together. And so the content is great, is great because it helps us with that. But it's not really about finishing the book. Yeah. The next question that uh, would be asked is, can someone come to the big group and not participate in the small groups? Unfortunately not, because if you haven't uh, connected with the small groups and prepared, then what value would you really be adding? And we're looking about value add more than what you're receiving yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other question is, can someone join the Silver Club halfway through a book? Like we start the book Tamati and we're in week five or six. The answer is yes. Community, just like going through content, is a big part uh, of the Silver Club. So we are also keen on outreach. Therefore, individuals can join in at any given point. However, they will need to adhere to the small group's rules of engagement. And we'll be asked that can someone uh, 
will there be any of on, online sessions all the sessions will be in person for the big groups uh, we you know when corona happened i really miss that in person gathering and that's what we will do we're, we're trusting god that this corona is going eh? that's that's my belief and so we'll be meeting in person mm. the next question is what will the mentorship of the next generation look like since we say that's our big value Number one, there will be mentorship of individuals. Everyone will be encouraged to have two younger people or a younger couple that they will be mentoring for a defined period of time. So you say for the next one year or two years, I'm working with these people and then we'll guide you and teach ourselves how to do that. So the Silver Club shall coach its members to understand mentorship and hold them accountable to ensure that they are all journeying with a younger person. And when it comes to group mentorship, we encourage the Silver Club members to avail themselves as mentors and sponsors to our Propel Forum. This is our college students and young professionals forum, just like this one. Uh, and we also have another um, class we call the Solid Roots. This is for the ex-candidates program, those who are waiting to join college. All around, all of them will be about the six, the different sectors of society. And so there's a lot you can do to impact their lives. Now somebody once said that, uh, and, and they coined this out of scripture in Matthew 18, 18 to 20, that where two or three are gathered, the Lord is there. But where two or three are also gathered, there is a rivalry awaiting to happen. There is a domain awaiting to brew. So we must have rules of engagement. And here are some rules that the small groups will have, just so that we do things decently and in order. Number one, have fun. We want to have fun. The other thing is confidentiality. Uh, what's done in Vegas stays in Vegas. So confidentiality will be very critical. We don't want to hear anything shared within the small groups or in confidence becoming a prayer item outside. When we do our praying, we'll pray here and leave it here. <laughs> uh, the other thing is keep time. Time is one of our resources that is quickly running out. You know, the other day I figured February is over. Can you imagine? And I'm going to be turning 55 in June. My uh, and the date is 6th June. You know, I'm just that, that is advertising. <laughs> My Mpesa number is uh, anyway. I'm just saying let's keep time because time is really running out fast. The other thing is stop mind reading. Uh, ladies in the house, you can say amen. And gentlemen, rather than amen. saying mind reading, <laughs> just speak out and say what you have to say. Do your assignments. Earlier on, this was shared. Preparing well for meetings makes you sharpen well. Proverbs 27 17, iron sharpens iron, so we'll be sharpening one another. Participate in the small group discussions every month. Do not dominate the discussions. Some of us need help with that. We can go on and on and take over. <laughs> there are those that will be in our midst that are more quiet and just give them chance and allow them to talk. Seek first to understand than to be understood. And then finally, people are responsible for their learning. We don't send people remind, reminders or follow them up. Uh, at this age, you should not be babysat, uh, God forbid. You should be able to have your own initiative, do your own things without being told and be responsible. Mm -hmm. What he forgot is that we had actually said have fun three times <laughs> in between the others yeah. because it's very important that in the midst of all this that we actually have fun. And so when it comes to the leadership of the Silver Club, the ministry will be under the leadership of the Beyond Sunday Movement core team, a team that we are putting together. Today we'll introduce you to some of them which is under the oversight of the Nairobi Chapel, Lovington Pastoral Team. The leadership team will be responsible for the ministry goals, the budget and activities of the Silver Club. The team will also ensure that there is synergy and collaboration within the initiatives of the Beyond Sunday Movement. So what are the, some of those initiatives of the Beyond Sunday Movement? Uh, we have PROPEL, which is a university students and young professionals monthly forum. You'll see that also in what will be shared with you. Number two, the Solid Roots, which is the ex-candidates, three-month training and year-long mentorship. The third one is the BSM Beyond Sunday Movement Studio. 
online content produced by different age groups. The fourth one is holiday camps for children and teenagers. The fifth one, the beautiful feet ministry under the logo scholarship and the love festival. And then the sixth is the schools and university outreach, which is very, very critical. Our young guys need to be reached out to. Yeah, so you'll get to understand some of these initiatives that you know are part of the Beyond Sunday movement, but uh, Silver Club is one of those initiatives on that platform. So I would like to invite uh, Stacy to come forward um, and uh, Reverend Faith Mugera, who will pray for this team as we lead the Silver Club. We believe some of you will join us to help us coordinate a few other things. For now, this is the leadership of the Silver Club and uh, Reverend Faith Mogera will commission them and commission us. And uh, like we've said, feel free to welcome other people in your spaces who need to have these conversations once a month. And let's see what God will do with this. Karibu sana. Good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to see your non white silver hair. I'm actually looking to see. Maybe Canon. Um, <laughs> no, I was, going to, I was going to say to Canon um, Mbogo that one of the things that was such a. Even when I thought about silver, I thought it was the hair. And I think only John here is representing well. The rest of us have alternative. Who, ah, I see you, Dr. Tari. <laughs> Now, my husband and I have this conversation about the silver hair a lot. Uh, half the time, I want to dye his hair in the night. But maybe there's a, now that there is such power in silver, as has been explained by Canon Rose, it might be, I might just let that slide. But I turned 51 a month ago. And, and every time now they say 50 plus, so that I'm now in the same age bracket as Canon Rosemary, who has four grandchildren, I begin to panic. <laughs> or oh, eight. I took four away. My, you see what 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 fifty does. <laughs> um, I I get into those spaces of anxiety and those spaces of dilemma, those spaces of questioning, and and I begin to to figure out to try and figure out. So what does it mean in this next halftime of my life? And I don't know how many of you have read that book um, called The Halftime. <clears throat> when I turned fifty a year ago, in the midst of COVID. I'd ask my husband for one thing. I said, please, no gifts, no nothing. I just want 50 of my friends and that we can dance. And we danced until 9.59 p.m. before curfew locked us out. I don't know how many made it home. Actually, I never figured that out. <laughs> but one of the joys um, of my commitment that the Holy Spirit of God just allowed for me to have clarity on was a place of living a legacy in lives. In lives. And the privilege God gave us as a family in the last two years of lockdown was beginning that legacy in our boys. We are the college transition stage. We are heading to emptiness thing. I really, let me tell you one of the things I've always known is that I will find you one day, Canon Rosemary. You don't know that you are my hero. <laughs> I've had you speak at many occasions. You actually spoke at my dad's funeral three years ago at St. Francis Church, Reverend Joyfrey Murori. And um, I'm getting emotional. But it's just the legacy of those who have deposited in you that allows for your life to thrive. Patrick and I, um, let me introduce my husband, Patrick. That's Patrick, who can stand up now, unless his, his knees are giving way because he's over 50. <laughs> my husband, Patrick, and I have been married 23 years and dated nine. So that's been, we've been together, like dated without a break. Like we never like took a pause. Can you imagine that? I wanted to, then he gave me an ultimatum, then he changed. And then now he married me. So I, I don't know what was that was about. So we've been together 30 plus years. But one of the things we recognize as a legacy is that our children have to be part of our journey of what we are depositing. But there also has to be a legacy of those spiritual children outside of our natural ones. Very soon, we'll have several bedrooms left in our home. We've been having conversation about what to do with those bedrooms. Should we begin inviting boys 
who, and that's because we have two boys and we have several other boys that we um, care for. Should that be our journey? And those are the conversations that this forum allows for us to do. And I'll tell you why. Because God made it very clear in his word that the reason I allow for you to walk the journey that you walk as individuals is not for yourself. It is for the generations coming after you. I marvel at the cyclical space of generations. I mean, right now we are aghast at the LGBTQ agenda, in shock at our children living together in the Sunday newspaper uh, this last Sunday. There was an article about how casual sex has been in our generation. I mean, it's an in and out of thing. And every time we are counseling with a couple, I can't remember the last time. And they, when they fill out their forms, they say they're godly, they give their testimony. God is my personal savior, their journey. Then we find out they're living together. And I'm like, how, how did we get here? Where is that discrepancy between what we confess and what we live? It is because no one has counseled and mentored us. They say there's a direct relationship between how your marriage or how your parenting thrives with how you saw your parents live together and how they parented you. There's no other place to learn it unless you have others who have spoken life over you. And so John and Stacy and others who come around you as you chat forward this that is such an amazing journey. Right? Let me read for you what Psalm 78 says. And as I read this, I want you who are listening to decipher how many generations are broken down before God as he speaks this word to his people. This is what he says. My people, listen to my hearing. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open up my mouth with a parable. And this is a parable that I will utter hidden things from old, of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have taught us. We will not hide them from our descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, the wonders he has done. He has decreed statutes for Jacob, established the word. He commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and yet then in, and they in turn would tell their children. How many generations are those? Could be five or six in a casual statement, okay? This is why that is important. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. That they would not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Because when you speak life into a generation, you change the trajectory of what happens. This um, same psalm goes on to say what God does with a rebellious generation. There's serious punishment out of disobedience, out of the counsel of God. There's serious trouble. We see that around us right now with the levels of divorce and broken marriages and what that means to that generation of children who are in that space. And yet we can bring healing as a next generation um, group of frontiers that can change and turn the key and the tide of the enemy. We can speak life. We can speak transitions. And we must purpose to speak for the next generations coming after us. And so allow that we commission this team for the dreams that you have, the exciting, exciting things ahead of you. I'll join you for the fun events. I, I heard that you said fun 20 times. I hope, hope you are climbing Mount Kenya. Remember what <laughs> Kanamboko said? This is a time to be adventurous. This is, I'm in the gym five times because I want to climb mountains. I'm ready to be the Himalayas. And, um, and I, I just, I think there's such a sense of deep adventure ahead of us for what... Um, this particular time in our season allows for us. Our time management is different. We have, we can manage it differently. Our homes are now open. Our resources are a little more fluid. I, I think there is time, even for you, oh man of Meru, <laughs> to allow for us to come and access what happens in that land. Um, there is just so many exciting things ahead of us. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't do take anything else, take this one thing. What life will you make different as you exit this world? Who is the one person whose life trajectory you changed because you deposited in their lives? Because that deposit will change the generation coming many times over after you. Please stand up that we would just bless.
I'm asking that you faith, you stretch out your hands to this um, leadership team, but also to yourself as you receive what God has desired for you in your season of impact, of legacy making, of generational change, of trajectory, assignment, divine assignment of God. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, that you're a God of seasons and times. We thank you that day and night, moon and, and sun, um, autumn and winter, rain and sunshine belong to you. And that Lord, your word has instructed us to teach us that you have promised you would teach us to number our days aright, that we would gain hearts of wisdom, that we would gain hearts that allow for us to counsel, that because our age has given us opportunity to understand our networks, our influences, the mistakes of the past, what we should do or couldn't do. Father, all those deposits are wise counsel, are wise um, deposits that would allow the worth of silver and gold to be ours. This value that we can pass on to the next generation so that they would know the God who is able to do more than they can think, that they can ask or imagine. That, Father, you would allow for us to know what it is that we can and must do to give them an identity that is strong and aligned to the truth of the gospel. That they would know who they are in you because you spoke life into them. That we invited them to follow Jesus as we followed him. That we know now what it means to align ourselves to the power of the cross because it's victory over everything around our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would allow for us to know that this is the power that we have been given in Christ Jesus to change the trajectory of our children, our children's children and generations coming after us. Thank you for these men and women who have desired and have purpose to be a part of this journey, for this fellowship of believers who have purpose to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, to encourage one another, to cheer one another on, to bring on board the next generation that would speak life into their space. We thank you for John and Stacy. I just delight in this couple and the power of ministry that you have given to them. As they come into agreement with the things that you have assigned for them to do, I pray that, Lord, you'd give them protection from the wiles of the enemy. We declare and decree no weapon formed against them will prosper, that the works of the enemy would be scattered as they chart forward what it is that you have purpose for this group, that, Father, you would give a special destiny for their children and their children's children because they have chosen to align with you with their children and their children's children, but also the other spiritual children you'd allow for them to birth and bear. We thank you that they are living an example of what it is you have desired for us to do with this that you have deposited into our lives for this half time of our lives. How I pray, Lord God, that you give them wisdom and exciting things and dreams and visions for this group. That, Father, you'd allow for them prosperity and resources and other things that would align right to the leadership that they will give. I pray for moments that they will hear from you specifically and that they would step out in obedience to do what it is you have instructed for them to do. Thank you for Pastor Judy who has opened up this platform for this church that allows for different generations to express and know of the goodness of the Lord. We pray for intergenerational connections, for intergenerational relationships, for intergenerational um, memory making spaces for places where we can speak into each other's lives, experience a digital generation and know how to speak to it. Realize there's a metaverse now together we don't understand and yet God, you have given us counsel beyond what is man-made. So Father, for Stacy and, and for John, for others who would bring, you would bring to be, be a part of this leadership, we pray for a special God-given assignment and a divine anointing. That Lord, you'd give them every good thing to align to your truth, to align to your direction. That you'd allow Pastor Judy and the leadership of this church to continue opening up these platforms and speaking life into the brokenness of the world around us. Lord, you have promised that the things you have given to us in Deuteronomy 29, 29 are ours, but they are also for our children, our children's children. Oh, may it be that we would not die with these things that you have deposited in our lives. As a man of God said, won't you allow us to pour ourselves out into emptiness? That by the time we are being called home, it's because we have truly, truly run the race and be emptied of these things that you have poured into our lives. Oh, may we run, may we run with special knowledge of the assignments ahead of us. Father, I pray that in the networks that are represented in this group, 
Lord, you'd allow for us connections into places that the enemy has taken territory. Oh, give us opportunity to conquer for the sake of the kingdom what it is the enemy has stolen. In the places of broken marriages, in the places of um, children who are, are deviant, in the places of drugs and alcohol, in the places of uh, marriages that are, are, are not aligned, the places of corruption and bribery, in the places of businesses that are compromising the truth of your word. Oh Lord, may it be that this would be the light on a hill that draws many to yourself. This group will be that special assignment that allows Christ to be lifted up and many brought to him. Father, I thank you for the conversations we've had this morning. Thank you for the special reminder that age is a privilege. That, Lord, we have such a depth and a deposit in us that you have given to us. In resources, in ambition, in obligation, in intention, in resilience, in conductivity, in connectivity, in all the other places that as a group and as a, um, a maturing age we have in our hands. So may it be that you give us boldness and courage to know what to do with these that is in our hands. And that, Lord, when all is said and done, we would be able to say, Lord, you gave us this gift. We use them as you desired. We ask for unity. We ask them for the special blessings that come with unity. Your word has promised you command your blessings of our agreement. So, Father, may we see you do more today and in the coming days as we live right and align with you. Um, as may we see more in the power of agreement and the blessings you have promised for this group and for those you'll be bringing. Thank you for the day ahead of us, Lord. Would you just allow for us to mull over this truth that we have heard, make a special commitment to be a part of this long term, invite others to journey with us. Indeed, as someone has said, that we'll sharpen one another and that, Lord, would learn the joy of fellowship and the joy of cheering one another on and the joy of celebrating milestones and seeing you um, do a different thing with the generation coming after us. So we bless you for this group, for the team that will be leading them, and for this special moment and inauguration. And we commit it to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Thank you. So once again, thank you so much for coming. We'd like to take this opportunity to share the words of grace together. God bless you. Have a lovely day and see you on the last Friday of March. Uh, please bring a friend. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.